side. Well, I want to welcome everybody back to um, our webinar series, Illegal Drugs and Opioids in Indian Country. Um, my name is Stacy Eagle Elk. I'm the program director for the Great Plains Tribal Opioid Response program. Um, we have funding from SAMHSA that's made this training available through our grant. Um, and I wanna thank them for that. I also wanna thank our Native Connections program, our HPOG program and our EPI program for partnering with us to make these trainings available. Today, um, just a few housekeeping um, items is recordings. The session will be recorded and it will be posted on the Great Plains um, Tribal Opioid Response Webinar Series page. I'll provide that link in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, could you please put them in the Q&A box and we will be facilitating that for Sarah today. We had a little bit of a change up <clears throat> We had Dr. Megan O'Connell, who was scheduled to be here today and due to unforeseen circumstances wasn't able. And Sarah Shoebrooks, who is part of my team, I'm not gonna say my team, she's part of the team that's working on the um, Tribal Opioid Response Grant um, in our EPI Center. And she graciously, um, said she would step in and provide information that she had on presentations information. I don't have a bio on Sarah, so I'm gonna let her introduce herself. Um, I will be putting some things in the chat um, for this survey and please indicate today's session data on drug use in tribal communities. Um, and with that, I am going to turn everything over to Sarah. Thank you for joining us today, Sarah. We look forward to hearing what you um, your presentation. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm going to have a presentation for you guys today. Just one second. I haven't had to do this on Zoom in a very long time, so I can assure you it might go a little unsmoothly for me today, but we'll get through it. And as you can hear, I do have a toddler on my lap today. So look forward to that as well. <laughs> All right, so let me get, are you able to see just the slide on the? Um, we see the next slide too. Okay, so you got the notes one. All right, go here, see if that. We'll do it that way. I'm going to reverse my screens. Apologies, everyone. It's really not a Zoom presentation these days if it doesn't go exactly as planned. All right. Is that any better? Perfect. Great. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for bearing with me through that technical beginning. Um, as Stacy said, my name is Sarah Shoebrooks. I am um, a, one of the epidemiologists and data products manager in the Great Plains Tribal Epidemiology Center. And I'm going to talk to you guys today about um, data and drug use in Indian country. Uh, this is actually an adapted presentation. Um, we had given the, or we being uh, myself, uh, our data coordinator, Sean Jackson, and the former data coordinating unit director, Dr. Corey Smith, uh, we gave a version of this presentation, which goes over the first year of funding that we had um, in the data coordinating unit in the EPI Center uh, to address the opioid surveillance or issues with opioid surveillance in our area. And the findings that we had in year one, especially around data, um, were very, very important. And so I felt even though we're now in year three of our grant, not much has changed, especially with most um, public health activities being redirected towards COVID response. Um, not a lot has changed in the last two years, unfortunately, but that means um, that I'm able to um, kind of give you this information that we had already kind of gleaned a year or two ago, and it's still mostly relevant. Um, so, um, I guess a little background on myself. I am 
uh, like I said, an epidemiologist, data products manager. Um, I took a winding road to public health. When I got out of high school, I went to college and changed career paths or uh, focus multiple times and eventually just dropped out and joined the military. And I served seven years as a, uh, in military intelligence. Before getting out, I decided I wanted to serve in healthcare, thinking I'm gonna be a nurse. I didn't know what else to do, but my advisor talked me into um, focusing on public health to knock out my pre-nursing credits. And I fell in love with public health and uh, went right on to get my master's and have been with the Epi Center now for two years. <clears throat> so um, to go, just to kind of get started, I'll kind of tell you a little about the Epi Center first. Um, so tribal epidemiology centers, there are um, basically the United States is broken up into these uh, sections you see on the screen here, with each uh, colored area here having a tribal epidemiology center assigned to it. So we are actually in the purple there, the North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska region. It's marked Northern Plains, but we refer to it as the Great Plains area now. And the services that we provide are a wide range of epidemiological services. And they include data collection, evaluation of data and programs, um, helping identify health priorities in tribes, making recommendations for health services, uh, improving healthcare delivery systems, um, providing technical assistance like data assistance and other forms of technical assistance to tribal organizations, and um, also disease surveillance and data. Um, and another one that's not listed here is actually, we often sit in a role of um, kind of liaisoning relationships between our tribal communities and um, state and uh, local state and government organizations. <clears throat> and um, what I'm really gonna focus the most on today is though is that last one, which is providing disease surveillance data to our tribes. And I forgot to mention that um, the four state region that we cover, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska has, 18 tribal communities within it that we serve and provide services to. So like I said, I'm gonna talk mostly about disease surveillance and data. And in particular, we're gonna talk about opioid data because that's why we're here, right? So when we were um, looking at the funding available coming out for, to address the opioid epidemic, we had been kind of watching what everybody has been seeing, which is the opioid epidemic kind of slowly creeping across the United States it really hit its um, fever pitch in the East Coast first. And it has been slowly creeping across the country and getting worse um, as it moves west. And as we were watching this happen, we thought, gosh, like we need to get ahead of this. We need to get ahead of this um, before we end up um, in a situation like a lot of our East Coast and um, Eastern Midwest states were in. And when looking at the issue, we really saw that there was not a lot of, um, well, one. so this is a survey, what I'm showing on the screen here. It was done by the National Association of County and City Health Officials in 2018. And it, what they found was that uh, a lack of data um, in determining, uh, being, that's usable to determine the problem and find solutions was the third highest identified barrier to conducting activities to address opioid use and abuse. And the only two that were, Higher than that were dedicated, a lack of dedicated funding and um, staff with expertise and training on the issue, which probably surprises no one here. Um, that is, tends to be the issue across the board for mental health and um, behavioral health related issues in the United States. Um, but without that data piece, that, data, that lack of data piece is very important. It's something in the Epi Center that we are kind of well equipped to focus on. So we decided um, with that, and once we did look at the data that we had available um, and kind of understanding the common data limitations that exist in American Indian data, um, which are on the screen. Um, so one of the limitations for the data we knew existed um, was that estimates of American Indian mortality rates are generally unreliable. Racial misclassification is a very widely known issue in American Indian uh, related data. And this happens for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it is legacy systems with, um, without the ability to stratify by um, American Indians being their own racial group. And that's something that still blows my mind. We see this constantly still today that American Indian um, Alaskan Natives 
often don't have the option to mark that as their race. Um, they're often lumped in as other, which we saw um, frequently in the last year. And so um, that's a known issue in American Indian data. And so we knew this was gonna be an issue in opioid data as well. And then also differences in coding on death certificates. Those who code death certificates are highly trained, um, but there's a lot of people involved along the way from when an opioid death occurs to when that death certificate is coded both by who puts race in and by the determination of death and cause that can cause a, a miscommunication to happen where they may not be identified as an opioid death. So we knew those were gonna be issues from the start. The other is that um, with the number of opioid related um, deaths happening in the Great Plains area still being kind of relatively low compared to other parts of the United States, um, we often cannot get data at the local level, meaning that we, the only data on American Indians we often have is at a state or national level, which isn't necessarily reflective of the tribal experience in our communities. Every tribe in our communities has unique issues um, and unique um, instances where they are um, the national or state level data, maybe not reflective of what's going on there. And then views offered by mortality or morbidity statistics don't fully capture the scope or complexity of the problem. And similar to that, identification of individual community and system level factors contributed to opioid misuse and abuse. And both of those speak to the complexity of substance abuse um, disorders and um, how those being identified and the social and structural levels that are uh, impacted or play a part in that, it's very, very complex. And so the data isn't necessarily currently equipped to deal with that. And then finally, the other data issue we knew about would be, um, it's really impossible to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions with providers, treatment, uh, recovery, and policy recommendations when you don't have good data. So these were all things that we identified, um, that and then what I talked about on the page before, which was just a general lack of data as being issues, sorry, everyone, um, as being issues that, um, needed to be addressed in the opioid crisis, specifically in our area, which led us to apply for the grant which we applied for, which is the Opioid Surveillance Grant. So we applied for this grant and the purpose was um, to support opioid overdose prevention in the Great Plains area by strengthening public health infrastructure in tribal communities through expanded surveillance. And so what I'm about to do here is talk a bit about the history of the, what we went through with this grant, because it, at the end, when I really get into the data component, which I know is probably what everyone's most interested in, um, our path, kind of the road we took to this, uh, the conclusions that we found in that first year, um, that path we took was important. So I did want to cover that and kind of show you the methodology we used to get to that final conclusion on the data which we were seeing for the Great Plains area. So components of our grant, um, there was four parts and still is, we are in year three, like I said, was to partner with tribes and key stakeholders to improve surveillance, assess the quality of data related to racial misclassification or classification across data systems, um, improve non-fatal overdose data collection and then improve fatal overdose collection. So those were the four components. And just to give you a more visual um, idea of what we did, phase one was the assessment phase. That was really that first year where we went through and we really assessed the data environment for opioids in our area. And then from phase one, um, and within the assessment phase, we had a task force that met. Um, it was, we invited everyone in the region who had an interest in this, tribal and non-tribal, to take part in our task force. Uh, the creation of an opioid data inventory, which I will cover. And then we did a data infrastructure survey, which all fed into our phase two implementation. And that's where uh, we are now. And admittedly, it has been significant, our activities in this uh, manner have been significantly slowed by COVID, but I will cover of the few things. And I should say by COVID, because as an epidemiology center, um, our job is to always respond to emerging um, public health needs. And so a lot of our activities 
had to redirect to address COVID-19 response in our communities and supporting our tribal communities because that really it, uh, became kind of the most pressing public health issue. So unfortunately it did delay a lot of our pre-planned activities like the Oak Grade Project, but we have still managed to do some work on it. And I'm gonna share a little bit of that work with you today um, as we go into kind of that data component. So the first thing I wanna highlight, and it is data um, heavy related, is this creation of an opioid data inventory. So the opioid data inventory was really spearheaded by my colleague, uh, our data coordinator, Sean Jackson. And what he did was, um, well, or the goal, I'm sorry, the goal is to research, identify, and assemble opioid related data sources for the benefit of the Great Plains Area Tribes organizations, programs, and partners. And this came about because in our task force meetings with our area partners, everyone kind of identified that we didn't know what data was out there. And the data that's out there, we don't know where it resides or how to get it. And it would be nice if there was a single place that we could all go to to refer to what, where, what and where all the data sources related to opioid um, use disorder live and reside and how people can access them. So the way we chose to address that was the creation of an opioid data inventory. And what Sean did, primarily Sean, I, I say we all worked together, but he really was the one who spearheaded this. Um, so he went into the development of the inventory and the inventory is developed using Dublin core standards, which is a set of technical specifications for describing any data set. That's like the definition, but it's basically a standardized way of describing a data set so that we could kind of use that as a template for information we needed about each of those data sources that are contained in the um, data and um, we'd be able to uh, apply that across the board for every data source so that we knew what was missing from some of them. Um, and then he went into database development and testing, which it is a, a Microsoft Access database. Um, and so he developed the, um, the basically the user side of that and all of the background stuff. And then um, we went into identifying possible sources. Um, he then uh, Sean went really heavy as he could into researching those source attributes. So things like what kind of data is contained, how accessible is it, what years is it available through, and then we added it to the inventory. So for each of those data sources, so this would um, these components here on the screen are available within the inventory for every data source that we have input into it. So each data source has kind of an overview section which gives um, information about the data source. Who was the sponsoring agency? So for example, if it was uh, CDC Wonder, which documents deaths um, and um, manners of death, uh, you know, the sponsoring agency might be the CDC. So then you know who the sponsoring agency is. It describes the data sets, gives limitations, et cetera. The other um, sections like methods contain things like how was the data collected? What were the methods used, sampling, uh, things like that. Contents were related to what indicators are in there. So what opioid related indicators are in there? Does it have American Indian representation within that data set in a way that can be stratified? Um, can you get it to the county level? What years of data are available? Things like that. Um, and then we have um, data requests and data access. So how you request the data and where you access the data. So that's all. Sorry, everyone. Um, that's all what is available within for each data source within that inventory. And so after we compiled all those data sets um, to kind of give you a brief overview of what's in there, uh, we ended up finding 29 data sources which uh, had opioid, opioid related um, indicators in it. Now, only 14 of those data sources contain American Indian data, so that only 14 were stratifiable down to the American Indian level, and only four down to the county level. And I put that in red and underlined it because that's very important in what the work that we do here at the Epi Center. In order to be able to provide data and information about a tribal community, we have to be able to filter that data 
down at by race. So it has to have American Indians included and then down to the county level so that we can use those counties to um, aggregate them for each tribe. So each tribe has uh, counties within their state that are associated with their tribal populations and we use that to characterize our tribes. So if we can't get it down to the county level, then we can't even come close to getting it to what we would consider the tribal level. Um, and that's really where that data becomes most useful, like I mentioned before, because you know what's going on at the state or um, or the, the, yeah, the state or national level isn't necessarily reflective of what's going on in each individual tribe because they're all unique. Um, so that's important. And then all the sources have a link provided that the viewer can follow to try to obtain access. Sometimes you can get direct access and sometimes you have to apply for access, but all of that is contained within the inventory. And the domains of data that were covered within that inventory were wide ranging. Um, there's criminal justice data, um, EMS data, morbidity, mortality, and I am gonna use the word morbidity a lot throughout this um, presentation. So just for those folks who maybe aren't as public health um, background, morbidity, when we talk about morbidity and disease, that actually is referring to the burden of disease while the person is living. So it's kind of the state, state of being sick is morbidity, where mortality is data on death. So any of the morbidity data is kind of the data on being sick, um, while mortality data is the data on having uh, passed away from the illness. Um, and there's also policy law and prescription drug, things like that, which are all listed in that inventory. So some of you might be saying like, where can I get this inventory? I wanna see all this data. So that actually kind of pops me into our next section or the next kind of deliverable we had in our um, opioid grant, which is the opioid surveillance hub. Now that actually did live in the implementation phase of our project. And luckily the, um, the creation of that inventory really helped us kind of bring forward the creation of that hub. Um, the goal of the opioid surveillance hub was to provide a kind of a one-stop shop for opioid data sources in our region. Kind of, a, it basically was gonna be an outward facing display of all the data related to opioids that we can find, including to the data inventory that I just kind of talked about. So you can access it here, which um, this is actually, and I know this is a not very helpful URL, and if anybody needs it, uh, we can email it out, but also you can get it to it directly from the Great Plains Tribal Epicenter website. I am gonna attempt, and we'll see how badly I rock the boat trying to do this, to bring it up on my screen here for you guys. So I'm gonna do a stop share real quick, and I'm gonna try to bring it up. I had it all up and ready, so hopefully we will be able to. Sarah, this is Stacy. We had a quick question. Will your slides be available for us to post and share with our participants? Absolutely. If they're interested, they're welcome to, to have access to those slides. And I'll Great. get those Thank to you, you Stacy. Thank you. Are you guys seeing um, the opioid surveillance hub up on the screen now? Yes. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know. So like I said, you can access this hub directly from the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board website. Um, and of course, when we send those slides out or make those slides available, you'll have the URL access as well. Um, but you basically go to Tribal Leaders Health Board's website. You go to the uh, Great Plains Tribal Epi Center's website, which you can access through that leaderboards health, um, Leader Health Board's website. Um, follow it to our programs here. And there's a link to the opioid surveillance hub about three fourths way down the page. But again, that URL will be available. So what we kind of put together was just a, a, a Tableau dashboard of the current data which we had available to us on opioid, which was only mortality. And I'll get more into why that's the case and what that means for us here in the Great Plains. Um, but it's basically a dashboard which toggles. You can just look at Great Plains area as a whole or you can look at individual states and see what their um, total population is, and then the deaths related to opioids. And the server is run by uh, Tableau and it's running a little slow today, so I apologize that it's kind of timing out. But basically these, once you toggled up at the top, would update for just the states. 
And what you'll note, yeah, Tableau server is having some issues. Apologies for that. But what you will see, one thing to point out is that due to small numbers, like I kind of mentioned before, and, and what I mean by small numbers is that the CDC or whoever's providing the data has you generally has a cutoff um, number of cases are related to a death in this case, where they won't release a number to the requester of the data if it's below a certain number. So for example, CDC Wonder, that cutoff is actually 20. So if less than 20 deaths have occurred in the given time frame, they actually will not release that data to us um, because they feel that it is too close to being identifiable by that point. So you would see if this was working, unfortunately, their server is um, being a little finicky right now. Um, that Nebraska, I think it's Nebraska, North Dakota, and Nebraska and Iowa all had data issues, um, meaning that I couldn't get full data for some component of this dashboard. And that just shows you how sparse even that mortality data can be. But if you scroll halfway down the page here, um, what you have here is both a link here to access the inventory, which I just talked about, and then kind of a breakdown of the components of data in the inventory. So real quick, I'm going to show you the inventory. It is an access database. So I'm going to bring that up on my screen here. Are you able to see the opioid data inventory? Sorry to keep having yes. to ask. Okay, thank you. No, <laughs> so um, this is the opioid data inventory. And what it, basically is a, uh, that link that is on the surveillance hub, you click it, and it gives you a prompt to just download this access database. And it's a pretty small file or relatively small. But what you can see here is a list of data sources at the bottom. And as I click through each of these data sources, it updates all of this information that I kind of told you about conceptually before. So, you know, the overview information relating to who the agency is that collects it, a description of the data. Um, over here, very important is the indicators. Um, is there American Indian representation? This one does have a American Indian representation in it. And then other attributes of that data. So as you click through, so here's BRFIS, one many people are familiar with, the Behavioral Health Risk Factor System. Um, you know, this is all data related to that BRFIS source. And then here on the right are, is information about how you can receive that data and where you can access it. So there's links. So here, this is the actual inventory, which I was kind of talking about before. Um, and so that's available from that opioid surveillance data hub. And sorry, the resolution on it is still not quite perfect. We're still working on that. But what I want to point out is this information here, which is kind of a breakdown of that data. So like I said, there, the total number of opioid data sources which we identified was 29. Now, the number of opioid sources identified which had American Indian data, like I said, 14. So of that 29, only 14 had the ability to um, characterize our population of American Indians in our area. And then the total number of opioid data sources which had American Indian um, at at least the county level, like I said, which is the most important for tribal uh, characterization, was just four. And then the total number of opioid data sources, which include American Indian at the county level, which were available to Great Plains, so up, us here at the Abbey Board, only two of those we currently have access to. The others we don't have access to for a variety of reasons, whether it be red tape type uh, th governmental things that we have to work through, or um, it's just simply not offered as available to us. But we know it's out there, so we basically know it exists. We just can't access it, right? So if we can't access it, we can't do anything with it. Now, what I wanna point out here and what's gonna really launch me into this next um, second part where I talk about data even more uh, in depth is that the total number of opioid data sources at the county level, which also include American Indian data is actually zero that are available at JEPTAC. And so what's different between the one I said before and this is that, um, that the ones that zero is that there's nothing except mortality data on opioids right now that I can access as an epidemiologist at Great Plains Tribal Epicenter 
that has American Indian populations characterized at the county level. And that's very, very important. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to my slideshow again real quick, and we'll see if I, oh, I have to probably reshare my screen. So I'm gonna stop share, and this will be hopefully the last time I have to do this. All right. So, All right, so I will share my screen. And I'm gonna have to click through real quick again. Apologies, I know this kind of kills the flow, but I thought it was important to show you guys that um, surveillance hub. All right, and so like I said, um, what I just showed you, which was that there are zero data sources available to me as an epidemiologist at Great Plains that can characterize American Indian populations at the county level so that I can tell our tribes what's going on for them, that's not mortality data, is zero. And this is very important because what this really shows us is that we don't just have a lack of data for our tribal populations, we have a critical lack of mor morbidity data because there's none that I have access to that I can use to assist my tribal communities that I serve. And so I'm going to show you a little more in depth now, kind of the road that we took um, to really analyzing that fact and kind of give you a visual depiction of um, what that means for us here in the Great Plains Tribal Epicenter and the Great Plains area overall. So that's going to pop me back into our surveillance project, because now we're walking into what we consider to be part of what was our strategic plan. And part of that strategic plan was really to develop a um, surveillance platform or surveillance framework for collecting, analyzing, and communicating that opioid morbidity data. So that opioid data about being um, sick with opioid use disorder or having opioid use disorder as a condition that they're um, living with. So prior to death, right? So first I'm gonna kind of talk about the word surveillance because um, what really is surveillance? When we say that in terms of opioid data surveillance, what do I mean? So I put this in here kind of to make everyone chuckle. But you know, a lot of people don't like the word surveillance. It can kind of conjure negative uh, connotations in their mind about, you know, maybe people's data being compromised or their private information being compromised. But when we talk about surveillance in public health, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is simply a continuous and systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of health-related data needed for the planning, implementation, and evaluation of public health practice. And if you want to think of this as a, in a really current and relevant way you can think about COVID-19 because um, you know when somebody is diagnosed with COVID-19 they're given a COVID-19 test and then they get a lab result and there's a, an array of information which is supposed to be collected by the health department um, and input into a standardized system and then authorized individuals are able to access that system and do analysis on that data and why would we want to do analysis on that surveillance data? Why do we think that looking at um, data on, I'm gonna stick with COVID-19 for now, but why do we think looking at data on COVID-19 is important? Why is that surveillance of COVID-19 important? And one is that it can provide an early warning. Now, obviously we couldn't do this a year and a half ago for COVID-19 because we didn't even know it existed, right? But now that we have data, on COVID-19 and its trends over the last year, that continued surveillance of that data allows us to now provide early warnings in areas where maybe cases are rising again. And we're seeing this already with the spring um, kind of people moving away from some of the mitigation efforts. So now areas where cases had fallen, we can look and say, hey, um, we're collecting this data surveillance data, it's real time, and we're seeing that cases are rising again, maybe we need to make some changes. So that's one way we can provide an earlier warning that cases might be rising again and try to stem the spread of that illness before it really, really reaches another critical peak. 
Another reason for data or public health surveillance is to clarify health problems in the community. Um, it helps um, us also, you know, or sorry, the clarification of those health problems um, allows us to better um, move resources and apply for grants and money and all that kind of stuff. It allows us to understand the problem so that we can apply appropriate resources. So that's another reason for that public health data surveillance. And one of the most important things it does is establish baseline data. And I kind of talked about that a minute ago with COVID-19. Um, you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, we didn't know it existed. And then we rapidly established a surveillance framework for um, collecting on that data. And then now a year and a half later, we can look over the year of, in a quarter or so of data, that we have on COVID-19, that first data that we're comparing now to is that baseline data. And baseline data is very, very important because otherwise without baseline data, we can't document the impact of our interventions either. So if I don't know how many people are, uh, for example, sick with any illness, and then I implement an intervention, how do I know that intervention worked if I didn't know the true impact of that illness in my community. So these are all really important reasons for why we do public health surveillance. And we felt that this was important for um, addressing the opioid crisis, because like I showed you in that very first slide, one of the number top three um, barriers to addressing opioid use disorder in our communities was a lack of understanding of the problem and data to support that. And we all know, most of us on this call know, you can't apply for grants, you can't get funding for resources without knowing the impact of that um, issue in your community. But when it comes to creating a data surveillance system for, uh, for and I keep almost saying COVID-19 because I'm so used to talking about COVID-19 all day these days. Um, but when it comes to establishing a surveillance um, framework for opioid use disorder, it was kind of like, where do we start? You know, we know surveillance methodologies exist and there's plenty of frameworks out there, but opioid use disorder compared to, for example, COVID-19 is very different. One is an infectious disease. The other is more of a chronic illness. Um, you know, opioid use disorder prevents itself very differently. It's not always going to uh, first present itself to somebody in a healthcare clinic. Um, and there's no test for saying that person is has opioid use disorder, right? There's no biological test. I can test somebody's biology to find out if they, for example, have been using opioids recently, but I can't say that their use is misuse at that point. So, you know, how do we develop a framework for surveillance of opioids that will help inform our public health practices. And where we really decided to start was with the data, which is what most public, or um, like I kind of showed with the inventory, you know, if you start with the data, you can start identifying your gaps in data. And so where did we start? We started with our mortality data. And mortality data is, of course, mortality data is important. Uh, mortality data, is kind of where a lot of public health interventions and things like that start. And it's because people notice death. Death is very dramatic. It's the most traumatic or the most um, negative outcome that can occur. And so people really take notice when people are dying of a certain condition. And so for that reason, there tends to be the most data on mortality when it comes to a lot of these issues. And so what I have showed on this slide here for you is a, a trend analysis uh, between whites in the United States and American Indians in the United States. And the trend from 2003 to 2017 of uh, opioid overdose deaths. And what you can see here is that um, they are both trending up in the United States, right? No surprise, but there is immediately a problem if you were uh, paying close attention to before with this data I'm showing you. And that's that I couldn't go in, not in a stepped analysis, so in these year chunks, so I can show you a trend over time. We couldn't do that at any level lower than the United States. 
So I couldn't do the same trend analysis with the data available to me um, for just the Great Plains area overall, and certainly not at the tribal level because of those data suppression issues that I talked about before. The numbers were too small. And so this doesn't necessarily characterize the experience of the American Indian communities um, that we work with. And we really just don't know. We don't know if it does because we don't have access to that data. So that's one big issue with this mortality data being our starting point. The other big issue with mortality data overall is that while mortality data is not unimportant, it's not actionable public health data. Um, mortality data only tells us that someone died of the disorder or illness that it's describing. But really, once the worst outcome has occurred, death, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't go back and help any of these people. It's too late, it's tragic. So mortality data, well, again, it's a good way to um, indicate there is a problem. There's not a lot that I can do with this data um, at, the, or at a more granular level to try to prevent those deaths from occurring. There just isn't enough information here. Where do I focus interventions? You know, all I know is that someone's dying, but I don't know what's lacking along the way for them, what system level, anything like that, that they're not receiving for whatever reason, um, because all it tells me is that they died, not the, not the um, path they took until they reached this point. So that's where we kind of decided to look at what we, what many of you may recognize, maybe not though, and I'll explain it, the cascade of care. So the cascade of care is a framework that was developed in response to the HIV crisis. Um, and the general idea was that for those who have HIV to fully benefit from antiretroviral therapy, they had to go through these different cascades. They had to one, know that they were infected with HIV, right? So they need to be diagnosed. They needed to be regularly engaged with HIV care. And they needed to receive and adhere to effective antiretroviral therapy. And this was brought it into the development of HIV care related stages that go from diagnosis of HIV through treatment stages until viral suppression was reached. And so these stages of care, which I'll show you a little more in depth, are what they are what is considered the cascade. So cascade being something that's arranged, occurring in a series or a succession of stages. So that each stage derives from the acts upon the product of the preceding. So that's why the waterfall is up here for you. Every level of the waterfall is being fed by the level above it. So back to, and I'm using HIV because this is where it originated, but I'll show you in a few minutes how this relates to opioid data surveillance. So with HIV, you know, everybody's at the top of the cascade, all the adult U.S. population, or actually the entire U.S. population in this case. And a certain, a certain percentage of the, of the population will be diagnosed with HIV infection, and they'll kind of move down into that second stage of the cascade. And only a certain percentage of those who are diagnosed with HIV will actually be linked with care. For whatever reason, a certain percentage of individuals who have HIV will never ever be linked with care. So they'll those will stay up in the diagnosis cascade and others will move down into being linked with care and then so on, retained in care, rece receiving antiretroviral therapy, and then eventually achieving viral suppression. So this is how the cascade concept works. And for every single gr group of individuals who are within each cascade that doesn't make it to the next cascade, so those who are diagnosed but never receive care, for example, um, they, the assumption is that they encountered certain obstacles to them being able to move to the next step. And those obstacles, and those barriers are what could be addressed in the, in the continuum of care in order to ensure more people are linked with care, more are retained, et cetera. And so this was really foundational in the way that 
public health looked at public health issues like this. It completely uh, changed the way that we looked at treatment gaps and helped us to quantify treatment gaps. And it really, this idea, this cascade and the, and the surveillance around these transitions between stages of care really are credited with helping move HIV from being a acute condition that was almost certainly going to be um, a death sentence for many to being a condition which can be managed and was more of a chronic illness today. And this work has been um, extended to other to many other um, chronic illnesses. Um, the continuum of care is also used, the same concept in hepatitis C management. So this is not a new framework, it's proven and it works. So how can we apply this to our data surveillance? And this is where we're gonna really hop into the most important part of what we learned. So now, you know, I've been talking about HIV and um, not quite related to opioids necessarily, um, but I wanted to really give you guys a um, kind of a conceptual idea and show that this, is, that this uh, cascade of care is a methodology and framework that truly is founded um, with good research behind it, that it works. And so now I'm gonna show it to you in um, terms of opioid and how we propose that could be used to surveil opioid related data. So we propose this opioid cascade of care and we broke our cascades into promotion, prevention, identification, treatment and recovery. And so in that first large green bar to the left where that says 100%, um, that contains 100% of the US adult population above the ages of 12. And they all fall into the promotion category because we look at each of these levels as a level of risk. So those, the entire US population risk for developing um, opioid use disorder is not terribly high. So the way that you would target your um, interventions at that really high level promotional upstream in public health, we often say, the way that you would target your interventions at that level would be very population-based interventions. So you would have things like, you know, school programming for all kids at a certain age on opioid use disorder and prevention. You know, like when I was a kid, it was the DARE program, right? Um, you might have billboards out. So all of your interventions focus towards that kind of generally low risk population are kind of more population based. But then that next group, so as I move from promotion to prevention, that next group, is, which reads at 31.8%. So it's estimated that roughly 31.8% of that adult US population is considered somewhat higher risk for opioid use disorder. So of my 100%, 31.8% have an elevated risk for reasons uh, like perhaps they have high ACEs score, the acute childhood experience, or they have substance use in their family, or maybe they're actually already dabbling in opioid use. So these people are already um, at, are, are at an elevated risk compared to the US population overall because of these reasons. And those would be the individuals who fall into this prevention. And so your public health activities at that level would be really targeted towards, uh, be, or the, I'm sorry, they would be more targeted, more specialized for people who have things like that, those who have experienced a, um, adverse childhood events and things like that. You would target those interventions a little more specifically for them. And then as you go through our cascade, in, of that 31.8% at high risk, about 2.3% will actually be identified as having opioid use disorder. And then of that 2.3%, 20% will get treatment and 23.8% will reach recovery. And these are all based on um, an article put out by SAMHSA. So these are estimates obviously, and there's always exceptions to cases, but this was kind of our idea behind how could we could adapt that kind of cascade Con, uh, concept into the data realm. So once we looked at this a little deeper though, we were contemplating on the idea of morbidity, mortality, mortality data not being exceptionally useful. And upon 
closer look, we really identified the identification, treatment, and recovery levels as being the morbidity kind of level of um, opioid use disorder. And so once we decided that wasn't um, specific enough, and so we felt that we should break those sections down a little more finely so that we can target our interventions and in this case also our data collection methodologies um, a little more specifically. And so you can see here on the screen, we took identification and we broke it down to both opioid use disorder and those who are actually diagnosed, right? So a lot of people who have opioid use disorder but are never engaged in care, so they don't get a diagnosis. And then treatment, we broke down to those who are engaged in care and those who are engaged in care who receive um, medicated assisted treatment, MOUD is what we, um, but medicated assistant treatment. And then our recovery is broken down to those who are retained for greater than six months and those who really reach what we would consider remission from opioid use disorder. So I'm gonna dive deeper into that. So all I did was zoom in on that area, which you couldn't really read the bars on because that first bar in our bar chart was so big. So this would be our morbidity section, right? And so very similar to the other, each one of these previous bars feeds into the next. So just like the cascade, so my waterfall, people trickle down from each level. So of those who received opioid use disorder, um, which was 50% uh, actually receive a diagnosis. So that means 50% of those who have a disorder are never diagnosed, right? And then of that 50%, only 40% of them are engaged in care. 35% receive the, uh, and of those engaged in care get Medicaid assisted treatment. Of that 35 who get that treatment, 68% are retained for greater than six months. And then of that 68%, only 50% actually go into remission. Again, these are based off estimates. But um, what is important here, you know, so I just put a bunch of statistics and stuff in front of you and all these bar charts based on theoretical things, right? What's important here is this. This is the gap. This is where needs are not being met for whatever reason. This is where people that kind of break between these bars are falling out of the system. They're not, so for whatever reason, of those who have opioid use disorder, half of them are never diagnosed. And if you're not diagnosed, many of us know, you're very unlikely to be engaged in care. And so when we looked at that all the way down, we saw all of this gap and we felt like this is important. This is the gap in need, this, or I'm sorry, this is the gap in care. And this is what represents our missed opportunities for treatment. And there's, like I said, there's a lot of reasons why people might fall into that gap. But, you know, all of our interventions kind of need to be focused into those gaps. And that's really important because in an ideal world, um, there would be no gap. It, our bar chart would look like this, right? Everybody who has opioid use disorder gets diagnosed. All of them are treated, all of them get um, Medicaid assistant treatment, all are retained and all receive or go into re full remission. Um, but we know that's not the world we live in. And so all of these gaps are, are areas where we could theoretically be focusing surveillance, data surveillance on to try to better understand why some of our intervention activities are not working. And so when we go back to, we stretch it back out, right? So I just zoomed back out and now I'm including my whole US population. And then I have that whole subsection of morbidity. When we zoom back out, all of these indicators at the bottom are kind of the headers for where we can focus our data surveillance on. We can pick indicators within each level of those, um, of this cascade that we promoted that helps us kind of, um, quantify that gap in care. And so what we did was we found all of the, not all of them, we found a good chunk of these opioid indicators and kind of placed them under each one of these header, promotion, prevention, use disorder, et cetera. So right here would be our headers. And then this is a very light list. So I just did this for presentation purposes. Um, 
but you can see here, so under promotion, under that cascade, that's just your total population, right? So that would just be like census data. But under prevention, you know, a history of other substance abuse, we can collect data on that history to help inform how many people fall into this category and interventions that might work for them. Now one, and we did this for all of those different areas. Now one important um, thing I wanna point out here is this remission. This remission here, we never found a data source, um, even out there that, that exists, but even if we couldn't access it, we never found that there was a reliable data source that could characterize the number of people who are in remission. Um, so that's one data gap that we identified at the time. But when we looked at all these data indicators, all, so all of these things on here, men, people with mental health disorders would be like a number of people, people with polysubstance use. When we looked at all of these as kind of data categories that we would say we need to collect on in order to be able to surveil opioid use disorder, we, uh, you know, we need the data, like I said, for American Indians, and we need it at the county level. When we applied those characterizations of what we need from the data, what we really found was that everything here that's crossed off in red, we don't have access to that data. We do not have access to any of this data at the Great Plains Tribal Epi Center because it's either not at the American Indian level or it's not at the county level or it exists right? But we can't get it for whatever reason. So if I take you back to my um, bar charts before, all of this area on the screen here that's grayed out, that's my data gap for the Great Plains area tribal communities. So I essentially know American Indians are born, born here, and I know a certain number of them die of opioid use disorder, but I really cannot tell you much more. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The data is sitting in silos. It's inaccessible due to uh, policy and red tape. Uh, like I said, it's not characterizable at the American Indian county level. So I, you know, I can't, if I can't give it to a tribal community and say, this is the counties that make up your tribe, and I just give them at the state level, again, that doesn't characterize their community necessarily. Now, that's often uh, kind of a depressing way to look at this, I will say a bright note um, from when I started this work, from when we started this work and then we collected all this data um, or data about data, basically. Um, from that time till now, the Epi Center has gained limited access to this pink bar, which would be um, opioid use disorder. And the, the way that we have gained some limited access is that uh, the state of South Dakota and the other states all have what we call a syndromic surveillance system. So this would be reportable conditions that are reported um, out into a standardized system. And um, there are opioid related indicators within that system. Um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we did gain some limited access to that system. Um, because of the public health need for our communities. Um, and we're hoping that we can expand that into opioid access as well. Um, and I think the, it's the, uh, the tone is favorable for that happening. Uh, we've been able to see like some pulls of the data from within that system, so we can't access it directly, but they've uh, graciously sent us some data pulls that we can see what kind of quality the data is. And so that's kind of a good news. Um, so the data gap is, kind of narrowing, um, but it's still there and it's still a very, very big problem. So here I'm gonna circle back to mortality again um, because essentially what I just told you all that as of the time when we did this work and we haven't seen much improvement since, that I'm kind of back to where I started. I, I have mortality data that's um, somewhat reliable. I can't reliably get it at the um, county level. Um, at least not, now I can get it over a large swath of time. If I ask for county, or if I ask for county level data over 20 years, I might get some data back. But if I want this kind of stepped trend data, I cannot, for the most part, access that data. And I wanna point this mortality data out again, because it's a good reminder that, like I said, like for every person 
depicted on my graph here in front of you, every person count, every number is a human being. It is a family member who lost their life to opioid use disorder. And I'll share, and I share this freely. Um, I lost my older brother to opioid use disorder. And I don't share this to get pity. I share this to remind everybody that it touches everybody everywhere. Um, more people than you know of um, have family members, friends, co-workers who struggle with opioid use disorder. And every one of these is a life, they matter. And we need to be able to engage them in care and develop um, interventions and to measure our interventions effectiveness, but we need data to do that. And so at the end of all of this, I essentially took you through a really long presentation to tell you there's no data. We don't have a lot of morbidity data. Some of that data does exist at the tribe's um, own level, as in they might have their own data that they collect, <clears throat> but we don't have access to that. And if the tribe ever needs help with that data or what to do with that data, we'd always be happy to help. But this is maybe like a little bit my call to action for everybody to say, hey, demand this data. We need this data. We need better surveillance. Um, and, you know, there's only so much us at the epicenter can do. Um, we are not the sovereign nations. Um, we just support our tribal members and their tribal communities. So real quick, phase two, like I mentioned before, um, heavily stalled due to COVID-19, but we're really hoping to get it back on track. We did finish a strategic plan and hope to instate an advisory council in some form. Uh, we'll continue to develop our surveillance hub. If we get that syndromic surveillance data, our hope is to make it available to our tribal communities in some way. Um, um, we are working on data linkage. This is probably the most exciting work that's being done in relation to this project is that um, the Northwest Epi Center developed a project um, that was extremely successful to address racial, racial misclassification within um, these systems. And it involved linking the um, healthcare system data to tribal registries. And we are in the process of um, going through all the legalities of um, executing a similar project here in the Great Plains so that we can address racial misclassification within our data sets so we can better um, capture this problem. Because I know hearing, I hear a lot from communities that met, or meth is the problem, it's not opioids. Um, meth is what's um, killing our people. And, that while that is true, um, part of the reason opioids are thought to not be a problem is because we don't have good data on it. Um, so we don't actually know if it's not a problem. And we do hear anecdotally from our tribal members that it is a problem. And of course, uh, co-occurring co conditions also. So those who use opioids may also be using meth, et cetera. So these are all reasons why this data collection matters. So I just wanna, these are acknowledgements, um, our funding sources, and I just want to thank everybody for coming here today and listening. Um, I hope it was interesting for you. And I'm ha more than happy to take questions. Unless Stacy has something else she wants to do first. Stacy actually handed it off to me. She had to leave. But um, yes, let's open it up for questions and comments. Do you mind if I jump in? There was a question from Facebook just asking if the dashboard showed ICS for the data that's in there. Hmm, I'm not sure what they what they meant by ICS. Did they? They didn't elaborate, but I can call it back and see if I get a reply before we're done. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that, or if they want to email that question to me too. And I do want to thank everybody for your patience listening to my toddler rustle me the whole time. <laughs> Sarah, we do have a question. Okay. Um, is there any tribe who is providing good data in the Great Plains area? So as far as what tribal communities have, um, uh, we, we are not necessarily privy to the data that tribal communities collect themselves. 
and they're not required to share that with us at the epicenter. So it is very likely or possible that there are some tribal communities out there who have um, some good data on their opioid use disorder and that we're just not aware of. Um, for many of our tribal communities, the capacity for collecting and analyzing that kind of data doesn't always exist. And that's kind of a function of the Great Plains Tribal Epidemiology Center. So if, I would say, if a tribe is out there that has data on this, um, but they need some help with what to do with it and how to um, analyze it, present it, or anything like that, we are here to help you and can help you with that. Um, but um, as far as who might have it, I would say for sure some probably do, um, but they're not required to share that with us. So Sarah, if, if a tribe or a program wanted that assistance from the Great Plains Tribal Epidemiology Center, who would they contact? So on our website there, um, when you go to the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board website, if you click the link to follow to the Great Plains Tribal Epidemiology Center website, there's a button at the top that says request TA, which means technical assistance. Um, there's also a request data tab. Um, both of those will link you to either Sean Jackson or Marilyn Prairie Chicken, who will receive the nature of, you'll have fill out a form and you know just a rough idea of what you're looking for. And they'll contact you um, in response and try to help um, find that data or information for you or connect you with subject matter expertise. Or if you're not comfortable doing that, always feel free to reach out to one of us directly, myself, um, any of my colleagues. Um, you can reach out to us via email and request um, what you're looking for. And we can, if we don't have the answer or the data, we can try to help connect you to who might have that information or data for you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Brooke, anything coming up on Facebook? I didn't get a response, so I'll just go ahead and let her know she can reach out um, via email, but that is all I have. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's probably an acronym that I should know, but I'm not, it's not coming to mind right away. So <laughs> I'm, it might be something that I can help them with. So we'll figure it out either way. Okay. Well, um, as always, if you want to chew on it or you have more questions or want to follow up, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to Sarah, Epi. Um, we can close it out. So um, as always, don't forget to fill out our survey. We try to get the recorded sessions up on our webpage. And we are hoping to get some slides up there too as we get those from past presenters. And join us next week um, for Consequences of Drugs and Tribal Economies with Dr. Noah Griffith. And uh, that is, this will be an especially interesting topic for tribal leaders and those on your economic um, advisory committee. So please share and let your colleagues know about that uh, presentation. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful week. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, team. Take care. Thank you.